Howdy, howdy. Welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection, where we're playing that game that's just an excuse to talk about records. I play the game with my brother, my brother being Plastic Eric, and he's over on the Plastic Soundwave Cult channel. Every Monday he shows a record, every Thursday I show a record, and the game that we've made out of it is to require each album to have a connection to the album that was shown in the previous video. And we ask you to guess what that connection is. At least usually. I'm going to play it a little different today for reasons of sensitivity, I guess. But we will be forging a connection between MC5's Back in the USA album from 1970 and Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper's Bodacious from 1987. But first we need to clear up the connection between the last pair of albums, which was MC5 and the Mall Historical Society's Loss album. And a bit of a sneaky one because the connection is that both bands are named after where they're from, with Colin McIntyre from the Mall Historical Society being from the Scottish island of Mull. And in a little less direct fashion, the MC5 guys are out of Detroit, AKA the Motor City which is what the MC in MC5 stands for. So we went uh, yet another week, no correct guesses. So with that all out of the way, let's get on with the show. All right, so MC5, back in the USS, I, I knew I was gonna say back in the USSR, back in the USA. I listened to it a couple times over, but I didn't seem to focus on it either time. Nonetheless, it sounded good to me. It sounded like a good record. The production style, maybe, that Eric was talking about in his video gives it a little ahead of its time sound to me and makes it feel like, you know, cheap trick or something at the time. Uh, very guitar, riffy, catchy, not crazy hard rock, or at least it didn't strike me in that way. So it wasn't like real fuzzy or loud, it was kind of refined and just made me think of like a precursor to power pop, which is right up my alley, which is good stuff. So I enjoyed it. I would say I probably enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the first album, uh, Kick Out the Jams. Forget if that's what it's actually called, but uh, the, the album with Kick, on the, Kick Out the Jams on it. Uh, when he played that one and I listened to it, I was a little more, eh, whatever. With that said, nothing caught my ear specifically. Again, I seemed to be doing things while it was playing and it, and it was over so fast both times that nothing leapt out at me. But I think the first non-cover, the track two, which I'm already forgetting the, the name of, uh, struck me as, as a pretty good tune. And overall, yeah, totally something I would listen to. And yeah, just like a real early example, and the production style seems to help it shed some of the, the boogie wooginess that a lot of that early 70s rock seems to, to drip with, in my opinion, that kind of turns me off a little bit. It was the one big sort of downfall in like Big Star, which as much as they're cited as a precursor for the kind of music that I like to listen to, and, and I didn't think it was bad at all, I think what really kept it from going over the top with me is uh, that just kind of that southern boogie woogie sound, at least as it, as I define it in my mind, and that didn't seem to be the case with MC5, uh, and they're certainly not from the south, being from Detroit. As far as the connection, I when I was doing my research, I noticed and was surprised to see that uh, Wayne Kramer, one of the founding members of MC5, uh, passed away just this month on February 2nd. And that made me think uh, about another musician that passed away just this very month, and that is Mojo Nixon. And so that's why I'm connecting this to Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper's Bodacious. Mojo Nixon passed just about a week ago, 
and it seemed a little insensitive to make recent passings the subject of a game, so I didn't want anyone to have to guess that, and I also wanted to be able to talk about, I guess, Mojo passing. Um, so I didn't want it to be part of the game aspect, so I'm just telling you, the connection is that both bands had somebody who died in very recently, in the month of February of 2024, which is when this video is coming out. Uh, Wayne Kramer and Mojo Nixon. While this is the only Mojo Nixon album that I have, uh, he did have a long recording career and a DJ career kind of after that. And honestly, I hadn't thought about him a whole lot recently when news of his passing hit me. Pulled out the record, played through it. Then when I found out that Wayne Kramer died, it seemed like a natural uh, connection, something to talk about, something that was already on my mind, something I was already listening to just this week. And so, yeah, I bought this back in 1987. I think the first Mojo Nixon song I was aware of uh, was called Burn Down the Malls, which was, I think, on Frenzy, the album before this, which I never picked up, but they played it on uh, MTV's 120 Minutes program with some regularity. And that's how I became aware of Mojo Nixon, aware of that. It was Elvis is Everywhere, the feature track from this album that got me to go out and buy the album. I'm almost sure I had it on cassette first before I bought it. Later on CD, because I wasn't really buying CDs in 1987 yet. So I think I had it on cassette initially. And I was interested to note that the original vinyl version uh, had two fewer songs than the cassette and the CD had. And the European pressing of the vinyl had a bonus track on it that is neither of the two tracks that are listed as bonus tracks on here, which are the story of one chord and don't want no foo-foo haircut on my head. Both great tracks. I can't believe that they are not on the original vinyl version, but I've always known it. Uh, they were on the cassette, they're on the CD, so I've never known them as bonus tracks. They've always just been two songs that are on the album. One of them is even, uh, I guess, what, what would have been at the end of the first side, so it's a track six it's right in the middle of the record this extra track um, but i guess it was running a little too long for the vinyl so they both got cut but they're both great songs elvis is everywhere is fantastic and so my story about elvis is everywhere is that when i was in high school uh, i was talking with a friend of mine listening to some mojo nixon and i told him you know if i was ever in a lip sync contest i think i would do elvis is everywhere because just the act of lip syncing along with Mojo's rant is going to be impressive enough that you would probably win just on the strength of that. And a few months pass and uh, I'm sitting at school at the lunch table uh, out on the patio and he comes up to me and he says, hey, I signed us up for the lip sync show. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, yeah, I figured we'll do Elvis everywhere. He said that uh, if they had a lip sync show, that that's what you would do. And I said, well, I meant that more in the hypothetical that if I were to do a lip sync show, that Elvis is Everywhere is the song that I would do. But uh, he got me all revved up, I guess, to do it. He kind of roughly played the part of uh, Skid Roper in the background, and we recruited a couple more friends to kind of do the backing vocals uh, with us. But uh, I went up and I performed Elvis is Everywhere in the Lip Sync Show in 1988 uh, at my high school, and we won. We were the winners of the competition, so I was right in my prediction that, that just the act of uh, lip syncing along with this song would be enough to kind of put you over the top. So, yeah, so I actually have performed in pantomime. Uh, Mojo Nixon on stage in my life and I'm not a person who's performed much of anything on stage so I have that great memory that is specifically tied to Mojo Nixon uh, but this album as silly as it is and it's a silly album I think is like they might be giants I think you're you would be cutting it short if you called it a comedy album it's got a lot of humor and I liked music uh, with a lot of humor in it uh, back, well, I like it now too, but really caught my ear back in the late 80s. So even though some of the jokes are childish, he does have a point of view and it seems to be an overall persona that he's presenting of being very 
unpretentious and that being unpretentious will reveal great truths to you. Things will become obvious how they should be, how they ought to be. And uh, he certainly has no problem telling you uh, what he doesn't like <laughs> on the album. Uh, there's I Ain't Gonna Piss In No Jar when he was against drug testing and opens with the uh, line, uh, I ain't gonna pee pee in no cup unless Nancy Reagan's gonna drink it up. And so it's got silly lines like that, but he is making a point. And uh, We Gotta Have More Soul, which is uh, the second track on here. It's got a great like Sam and Dave kind of bass line that is uh, just popping, you know, it's a, it's a barn burner to listen to. And of course Elvis is everywhere. Classic funny, probably if you know one Mojo Nixon song, that's probably it. Uh, he did have some other sort of minor notoriety type hits that weren't like hit hits, but uh, songs like uh, Stuff and Martha's Muffin uh, about <laughs> uh, MTV BJ Martha Quinn. And uh, I forget the exact title, but something like uh, Debbie Gibson's Pregnant with My Two-Headed Love Child. Uh, things that maybe went a little over the top. I think, I feel like this album really uh, nails the, the tone of being silly and yet uh, not being so silly that there's no way for you to like really express anything, of, you know, like trying to have points because uh, Positively Bodie's Parking Lot uh, is a great song. I find it actually kind of moving as a song. It's got a chord progression that is the exact same chord progression from uh, Neutral Milk Hotels in the Airplane Over the Sea. Uh, you can sing that song along to it, and it's sort of Mojo's version of a Tom Waits song, you know, kind of uh, backwater people uh, doing backwater things, drinking and uh, and shenanigans and whatnot. So it's kind of a very much a, a story song, and it's got some silly lines in it, and yet it still feels like it's got an emotional heart to it. So I, I really like Positively Bodie's Parking Lot and Wash No Dishes No More uh, is a great kind of sing-along, uh, easy one to sing along with because uh, you can pick up the backing vocals and just say anymore with them. But it's a uh, very simple song structure, but it is him going on a tirade of things that he doesn't want to have to do anymore to fit into society. And some of the couplets are super childish, but it's still resonates and it's a lot of fun to sing along with the two songs that Skid Roper takes the lead vocals on which are Lincoln Logs and the Polka Polka I would both describe those songs as ditties they don't feel very fleshed out but they're fun <laughs> Lincoln Logs has a little bit more going on with it than the Polka Polka is very just a very silly ditty uh, Lincoln Logs does have a little bit to do with kind of about childhood and uh, innocence and wanting to go back to that time, I suppose, but and they're both very short and uh, very silly songs and Mojo sings all the rest of them, but Don't Want No Foo Foo Haircut on My Head has the classic line of uh, Don't Be Like Charlie Sexton, A Prisoner to Your Haircut. And <laughs> if you knew Charlie Sexton at the time and the, the, the quaff he had going, then uh, you would definitely know where Mojo was coming from. And it's funny that he has very liberal views, I think, but 30 years later, uh, more than that, close to 40 years now, all this sort of, you know, uh, America loving stuff almost comes off as, as right wing conservative. Uh, but it's just Mojo espousing his, his views, his way of life about simplicity and an unpretentiousness and then there's a couple of songs gin guzzling frenzy and bbq usa that are just celebrations of those things those little bits of americana uh drinking gin and eating barbecue bbq usa is literally i think just a list of barbecue places that he likes so so there are some definitely light tracks but i think taken as a whole it presents a very specific point of view and Nobody else was exactly Mojo Nixon, you know. Uh, he didn't really fit into any club, and I think he liked it that way. 
Uh, I know he went on to record with a, a backing band called the Toad Lickers, uh, with liquor spelled like the beverage, spirits, liquor, Toad Lickers. But this was the only one I ever got, even so. It's been in my life for, as I say, better part of 40 years now. And I have a great memory attached to Elvis is Everywhere. And I just wanted to pay tribute to Mojo Nixon, who was there uh, for a key evening and, uh, and a lot of listens when my record collection was much, much smaller. And so I listened to Bodacious a lot. I will say that it took me a long time, an embarrassingly long time, to figure out that it was Bodacious just from the way it's spelled. I called it Bodacious in my head so many times in the early years because he doesn't say bodacious anywhere on the album so it took me a, a, a number of years to realize oh that's bodacious but uh yeah that's the name of the album bodacious uh i think it's a great fun little album i think eric will enjoy it i think there's part of him that may listen to this and say you like this but you won't listen to more mc5 or, or rock music <laughs> like that um because it did, it's, it has that southern sound, but it's not necessarily a boogie-woogie sound to me. But with that, I will throw uh, Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper's Bodacious from 1987 over to Eric, who will find a connection in his record collection and present that on Monday. So you can look forward to that. But uh, once again, I just went ahead and gave you the connection this week uh, because I didn't want to make their passing a... The source of a game so with that i would just say rest in peace mojo nixon i love this record and uh yeah that's all i got so i thank you for watching bye bye